Okay, finally, <coughs> excuse me, we went through beta blockers and how they reduce cardiac output by limiting conduction through the AV node. <coughs> excuse me. Calcium channel blockers are not super popular because they're very expensive. They have a pretty complicated mechanism of action where they block calcium induced calcium release. Why that's important is calcium is going to be what determines the strength of contraction of the heart. So blocking calcium channels limits how strongly the heart can contract. There's vasodilators like nitroglycerin. We've talked about nitric oxide quite a bit. Um, nitric oxide dilates any vessel that it's around causing vasodilation. So you'll see people using nitroglycerin either in a pill, a patch for stable angina, there's a nose spray. Um, that stable means that it's predictable. People get chest pain during predictable circumstances. Okay, so that can help. You don't want to be on one of those all of the time, ideally, um, but for stable angina, they do use them. And then we'll get into these really cool things over here that I promise have pretty straightforward mechanism of action. We've got our ACE inhibitors, which are going to target the renin angiotensin system. And then we have diuretics, which promote diuresis or water loss. Remember that uh, the plasma in vessels, that's like our bank of fluid in the body. So if we can limit the amount of fluid in the vessels in the plasma, that will lower the blood pressure overall. So diuretics and ACE inhibitors are going to have action on the kidneys in different ways to reduce the plasma volume and reduce blood pressure. So first, we're gonna go over ACE inhibitors. So this is one of my favorite systems, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And it's one of my favorite systems because it's really everything in the body working really nicely together. Make this smaller so it's not so, so uh, blurry quickly. Okay, so when the kidney senses ischemia. There are cells in the kidney called JG cells, juxtaglomerular cells, and their job is to sense lowered blood flow, so low blood flow. So they sense ischemia, meaning like you're dying, maybe you're going into shock and there's limited blood flow. The JG cells are triggered through that lowered perfusion means flow, flow through. So a decrease in blood flow through the kidneys triggers JG cells to make their product called renin. Some people say renin. Again, you can say whatever you want as long as you say it with confidence. So renin is a substance that on its own doesn't do a ton, but what it does is cleave a substance made by the liver called angiotensinogen which means vessel tension. So it's a really great name substance too. Again, angiotensinogen on its own doesn't do a lot. It needs renin to cleave it into the first product called angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is cleaved by a second substance that's made on the surface of the lungs and the renal endothelium called angiotensin converting enzyme. Really great name, angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE. And what ACE does is convert ANG1 into ANG2. And whenever ANG2 is around, it raises the blood pressure because it thinks that you're literally dying. <laughs> so it wants to save you. So it increases sympathetic activity. So all those nerves are going to get turned on from T1 to L2. It helps you reabsorb or bring back products you would normally urinate out, like sodium and chloride, so that where sodium goes, water follows. When sodium leaves the urine and then goes into the bloodstream, water goes too, it raises the plasma volume, raises the blood pressure. The other thing that it does is trigger the adrenal gland cortex section. Um, there's three layers of the cortex. One makes cortisol, another one makes aldosterone. Aldosterone is our sodium sparing hormone. So in the case that we don't want to lose any sodium, to the urine, we can shuffle that sodium out by turning off a pump in the renal tubule. And again, where sodium goes, water follows, that's gonna increase the blood pressure. So aldosterone release stops you from peeing out sodium. 
Um, angiotensin II physically can bind to receptors in the physical arterioles to increase their contraction. Finally, L or angiotensin II promotes antidiuretic hormone secretion. So just like aldosterone was our sodium sparing hormone, antidiuretic hormone is our water sparing hormone. Most of the urine should be water, it should be clear, and it should be light yellow, it shouldn't be dark. When ADH is released, it causes uh, water to leave the collecting duct, to leave in the urine, and it's brought back into the bloodstream. So that would be released in typical situations of dehydration. So all of these mechanisms are initiated by angiotensin II. So it's your body's way of keeping you alive. Isn't that great? Yeah, it is, unless it's overactive. So when individuals have an overactive renin angiotensin system, they're put on ACE inhibitors. And very straightforward, all they do is block the conversion of angiotensin I to angiotensin II by inhibiting this enzyme, angiotensin-converting enzyme. So we're going to get the blocking of that so there won't be antidiuretic hormone, there won't be aldosterone secretion, Instead, there's going to be a maintenance, hopefully, of lower blood pressure. So very straightforward, just blocks that enzyme so there's no conversion. And it's really cool, and I'll show you this in the next slide, that it's been shown to actually prolong people's lives. They live longer on ACE inhibitors than they would if they're taking other medications post-infarct. There is a really common side effect that most people cannot withstand. It's a dry hacking cough. So kind of like an allergic cough, it's, a, it's not productive, it's just constant, and your coughs can be really um, profoundly strong. So there's a lot of air forced down into the lower um, airways. And this is due to this system. When you take these drugs, remember I said bradykinin stimulates pain receptors. Uh, ACE inhibitors lead to a production of bradykinin, especially in the airways, which make them... Um, irritable, so they hurt, and the response to that is a cough. So that is the most common reason that people stop these medications. If they don't have that side effect, they can get all the good stuff from it. The other things that it's associated with side effect wise are just dizziness, weakness, loss of appetite, a rash, itching, swelling, or all things that have been reported in clinical trials. But they do work really well. These are your prills. So we had our zosins, our alpha, Olols are beta, angiotensin converting enzymes, the ACE inhibitors, those are your prills. So they should all end in prill. They should be easy to pick out. I hope they're sold as a bunch of different uh, trade names, but I want you to concentrate on the generics like enalapril, lisinopril. They all end in prill and they all just block ACE from converting um, into ANG2. So here's a cool thing. When they did some initial studies with these medications, they looked at a huge amount of patients, um, thousands of patients that had had um, a heart attack. And what they saw was that there was reduced death and reduced hospitalization uh, post-infarct when they were put on an ACE inhibitor. So either the patients had conventional therapy, so maybe they had a beta blocker or something like that, or they were on their typical therapy or, or in addition to an ACE inhibitor. What they saw was a 22% risk reduction with the ACE inhibitor two years later, which means they went to the hospital 30% less time. So they only, that's one out of three. So one out of three hospital visits in those two years were cut out. So that's really cool. They didn't have to go back to the hospital and they didn't have um, an increased risk of heart attack or negative effects. So here, this is the, um, the outcome from the trials that went out to two years. And this is, again, these were patients post-infarct. So heart failure um, and hypertension can fall into different classes. Like class one is like the least bad, class two is a little bit worse. Once you get to class four, that's when there's respiratory insufficiency at rest. So people are on things like supplemental oxygen. So we didn't see a huge uh, increase, unfortunately, in people with really progressed heart failure in class four. But those with lower levels of heart failure, again, they had much lower levels, especially class one and two of cases of heart failure. Isn't that awesome? So they lived longer. They had less hospitalizations. 
And this is now looking at time to their next um, event, their next health event. Those on placebo medications, they had another event and were rehospitalized usually about eight months later, whereas those on an ACE inhibitor lasted pretty much two years. So that's a really great case, even though this does cause a nagging, annoying cough for people on them. If that could be withstood, it physically leads to less death over time. Isn't that awesome? It is. Finally, there's just your good old diuretics, and diuretics work by making water leave. So when it comes to you staying alive, yeah, we want water in our plasma so that our blood pressure is increased. When people have chronic high blood pressure, adding a diuretic is a really nice way to limit um, water in plasma and increase water in the urine. There's a couple of different types. The first are loop diuretics. These are the strongest diuretics. Those include furosemide, which is sold as Lasix. And the way that diuretics work are by turning off naturally occurring pumps in the renal tubule. So in the thick ascending loop of the loop of Henle, there's a co-transporter. It's a cool one. It's a sodium potassium chloride co-transporter. So we see how here it's in red, the sodium's in red. That means that it's moving from this, this ductule, this, this uh, renal tubule, which is concentrating urine so that it goes and peed out. This moves things into the bloodstream. So loop diuretics turn off this co-transporter. So instead of bringing sodium and potassium chloride into the blood, it just stays in the urine and then it's peed out. There's thiazide diuretics. They turn off a co-transporter for sodium and chloride up in the distal convoluted tubule. Again, the sodium's in red. In this area, sodium can move into the bloodstream where sodium goes, water follows, blood pressure goes up. Thiazide diuretics, they turn off that pump so that sodium doesn't go into the blood and then neither does water. So if you notice here, with sodium going into the blood comes potassium, they travel together. So you end up, if you're turning this off, you're peeing out your sodium, you're also peeing out your potassium. So one of the main side effects of loop diuretics is low potassium. When that is really prevalent in patients and having two bananas a day isn't cutting it, they can be moved to potassium sparing diuretics. And potassium sparing diuretics work way over here. It's called the, the distal, distal convoluted tubule early cortical collecting duct. And there's a pump here that aldosterone turns on. Remember, aldosterone's our sodium sparing hormone. So in times when the blood pressure is dropping and we don't want to lose any sodium to the urine, aldosterone turns on, it's called an antiporter, meaning it's moving things in different directions. Aldosterone turns on a pump to bring sodium into the bloodstream and it trades it for potassium and hydrogen, which will then be peed out. So you get sodium in the blood, potassium and hydrogen into the urine. Potassium sparing diuretics like um, spironolactone, they turn off this pump. So again, instead of getting sodium into the blood, the sodium stays in here and it's peed out, but that also means the potassium is not going to be traded for the sodium. So we call it potassium sparing diuretics because the potassium can stay out here and not move into the urine. The side effect of potassium sparing diuretics is too much potassium. They can't have two bananas a day. And you know when people are low in potassium without doing their blood screens because they're complaining of things like muscle cramps. Slow potassium leads to cramping. So people call them their water pills, but really what they do is increase diuresis and they are named for where they work in the renal tubule. The strongest ones are the loop diuretics, so that's your Lasix. And again, the number one side effect is low potassium. So potassium sparing work um, to prevent low potassium. Again, side effect then would be the high levels of potassium. So that's what you see here. When you take water pills, you're losing the things that would typically go into the blood, like sodium and potassium, but you also can get dehydrated. You're losing a lot of water. And if that happens, you feel dizzy. You can have high blood sugar because your body wants to keep you alive. And if you're losing a lot of your water, you're gonna break into your glycogen stores. You might feel kind of tired. Again, cramping associated with potassium loss, rash in some cases. 
we don't use the term impotence anymore. I shouldn't put that on there. It's erectile dysfunction because of low plasma volume interrupting the erectile response. And again, potassium sparing means you can have too much potassium. And if there's too much potassium, that ends in muscle weakness and numbness, um, which is the opposite of tetany, which you would see with um, low potassium. So those things, they alter the actual conduction of the nerves that uh, feed muscle tissue, and that can be tested for in a nerve test. Okay, so these are the diuretics. You should know they end in thiazide if they're thiazide diuretics. Um, your loop diuretics most common is furosemide, sold as Lasix. There's also bumetadine. And then potassium sparing, the most common and popular because it's cheap, is spironolactone. So if you know where those work in the kidney and just take a look at that picture that I showed you, you're going to know everything about them without memorizing any of this. And I believe in you. Good job, guys. Keep learning pharmacology.